Our speaker for the session will be our good friend, Dion Foster. His only son that he is a Methodist. Um, <laughs> um, his greatest, they say. Uh, he's well known to all of us. He will speak on African theological perspectives on intersubjective identity in conversation with developments in strong artificial intelligence. Friends, colleagues, let's give a hand to Dion. Good uh, afternoon, colleagues, and uh, thanks to the son of the king, uh, Eugene. Eugene is, I think, the world's uh, greatest Elvis Presley admirer. Uh, so that's why I call him the son of the king and a great colleague and friend. Um, colleagues, I, I don't have PowerPoint, and I realized that possibly I should have done so because some of what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit obtuse and um, a little complex, but let's see how we go. Uh, if after this you're as confused as I am, there is a written paper and I'm happy to email it to you. Um, so you, you can always uh, speak to me about that. I'm gonna try and stick to my text because uh, it's timed more or less at just, just on 30 minutes. In November, 2002, OpenAI released their ChatGPT large language chatbot to the public, and the technology very quickly captured the attention of persons on social media as they interacted with it to draft essays, poems, and even sermons. I know none of you did that. The technology relies on uh, language learning to perform tasks, and this means that it's programmed to find information via the internet and present it in a style that is eerily familiar to how human persons might perform such tasks. One of the major concerns, particularly amongst educators, was whether persons would be able to discern the differences between content generated by artificial intelligences, such as ChatGPT and others, uh, and human persons. Several commentators accentuated aspects of human uniqueness such as memory, experience, and emotion as possible differentiating factors. Nick Cave, for example, spoke of the way in which tragedy and suffering textures the human experience when he was asked by one of his fa fans on his blog, The Red Hand Files, uh, whether a song written by ChatGPT in the style of Nick Cave was any good. The South African journalist, Gus Silber, wrote a beautiful piece on chat GPT and wine. I don't know if you've read that. Uh, the reference is in the paper. It's well worth reading. And he spoke about the notion of the human sense of taste and its broader relationship to memory, social and geographic setting, temperament, and a host of other factors that are unique to Stellenbosch that make chat GPT incapable of offering a worthwhile assessment of the quality of a bottle of wine. Now, while this may be true, it's undeniable that AI has entered a new age of human and technological connection. And this paper will facilitate a critical theological engagement with AI in relation to an aspect of African theological anthropology, namely intersubjective relational uh, ontology as one way of exploring a relationship between human persons and emerging AI technologies. It will do so uh, in relation to the claims of strong artificial intelligence, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, later on. But it will also do so in a realist and pragmatist manner, um, approaching computational uh, theology in an African key. Now, by this, I mean that artificial intelligence actually exists. It is a current reality. And pragmatically, artificial intelligence is being engaged, uh, whether responsibly or not, by many persons. And of course, AI's pragmatic application doesn't mean that it cannot be critiqued and that it should not be resisted at times. 
But what I think we need to acknowledge, colleagues, at this conference is that it can not be ignored. Now, in this regard, I'm thinking of the task of theology and the way in which the African Methodist theologian, I add Methodist there, uh, Mercy Amba Odoyoye describes it when she says that theology remains, I quote, a story that is told, a song that is sung, a prayer that is uttered in response to experience and expectation. And the questions that occupy my mind is what is our experience of being human persons engaging with the world in which we live, which now contains AI? Secondly, what is our expectation for ourselves and the world in which we exist alongside these developing technologies? So let's begin with a brief discussion of recent developments in computational theology in order to understand how some theologians have recently been engaging with experience and expectation. Now, the first thing that I think we need to do is offer some conceptual clarity on what we mean when we speak of AI. The term AI can naturally refer to a diversity of technologies. However, in this paper, I'm specifically interested in that branch of AI that studies the nature of human intelligence and whether it is possible to build machines that replicate or even outmatch human cognition. Such technology can be broadly classified in two classical schools. The first is symbolic AI, and the second is sub symbolic AI. So let's talk about symbolic AI first. This is what is known as classical artificial intelligence. Um, some of you may know that I did, a, I did a doctorate on artificial intelligence in the year of our Lord 2005. Uh, in those days, it wasn't as intelligent as it is today. <laughs> but then we were largely dealing with only with uh, symbolic AI. Now, this is a technology that explicitly attempts to represent human knowledge in declarative form through rules and facts that are placed within computer programs. Now, a classic example of this, to illustrate it, is a chess-playing computer. It's programmed with the rules of the game of chess and set up to play the game as if it were a smart and efficient human chess player. Now, this form of symbolic AI is already being widely used by some theologians when they seek to deal with complex, large data sets. For example, there are programs that can search a large number of texts, in this case, particularly ancient texts, or linguistic patterns, such as grammar, grammars, related phrases, or semantic connections between words. And in this sense, the AI performs the function that a human person normally would do, but it does so in a manner which is both efficient and somewhat more accurate. So particularly in biblical studies, uh, this form of technology is used. Symbolic AI, it's programmed, it examines texts for words or semantic relations uh, or for phrases. The second way in which classical AI functions is what is known as sub-symbolic AI. Now, this is a progression in AI technology that focuses on designing and building machines capable of cognitive uh, capabilities such as reasoning, knowing, learning, perceiving, and communicating. And this is probably where we are now in the AI journey. A common example of this form of AI are the predictive algorithms that are used to predict the values of stocks on the stock market based on a complex set of in input data, such as historical stock prices, movements in multiple markets, values of countries, geopolitical events, weather events, and a host of other nodal activities. Now, what's interesting about these forms of AI is that they are self-aggregated. In other words, they learn from their mistakes and they reprogram themselves, supposedly with greater accuracy and efficiency. One example of the use of sub-symbolic AI 
in theology is uh, a, a case that I came upon by a philosopher called Rampath, who is using sub-symbolic AI to construct an image, a typological image of the notion of a saint. Now, this would require the capacity of the algorithm to access various forms of data, so texts and artworks, stories, plays, all sorts of input, and to bring them into conversation with, with one another, even when there are uh, conflicting commitments, ideas, and images of sainthood. And then to come up with some examples of what might constitute the concept of a saint. Now, of course, this, we could argue, is a somewhat speculative exercise. But by using prompts, one could, for example, focus the model of this sub-symbolic AI on particular contexts, particular traditions, or particular use cases. I can also say, um, and of course you may also be aware of this, but certainly in uh, applied ethics, uh, artificial intelligence is playing an increasing role. Now, in this sense, computational theology can utilize AI as a technology that aids theologians in the work of making meaning of dealing with complex and unimaginably large data sets and at arriving at complex and nuanced insights, some of which can even decenter the human person. Now, I think of this approach to AI as a utilitarian approach. So that's the first important concept I'd like you to hold on to. AI in this sense is a utility or a tool in the hands of the theologian. This kind of theological engagement with AI is not only utilitarian, but I also characterize it as anthropocentric. The questions that are posed are our questions, either about ourselves or they are questions about the topics with which we concern ourselves. And the intention of the use of AI in this regard is to inform our understanding and deepen our knowledge or insight into complex issues. However, there are at least two other ways in which computational theology does and could function. And these views see both the theological promise and the peril that emerges from taking the technology seriously as a truly generative source. Hence, it's not only an anthropological utility used by the theologian, but rather it could present the opportunity of becoming a fellow thinker, a fellow prayer, a fellow theologian. Now, this is the next point that we're going to focus on, the notion of robots doing theology. And this is particularly a conversation with strong artificial intelligence. Now, as mentioned above, we need to consider that to some extent at least, there is a possibility that robots could do theology. Now, I can imagine when I uttered that phrase, when I typed it, certainly I could imagine your faces as you recoiled from that thought. And particularly, I think uh, our, our second keynote last night uh, challenges that idea. The problem, of course, is that many of us have been formed to believe that only humans have the capacity to think theologically. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to return to it in the next section when we consider the notion of the Imago Dei after Darwin. The question we want to ask now is, could robots do theology? Could an AI technology ever invite reflection, conversation, and a deeper and more nuanced theological understanding? Well, in a purely realist sense, the answer, of course, is yes, it can. This conference and this paper is proof that AI is inviting us to think about and even rethink some of the core tenets of our religious faith. But one can hardly classify that as robots doing theology even though I sometimes think some of my first-year students are sending me chat GPT essays. <laughs> Rather, what I'm talking about here is the instance in which 
a robot begins to engage its own existence in the same ways that we do. The question is, could robots ever do theology of their own, so to speak? Now, here we're not asking whether the existence of robots invites theological reflection, but could robots do constructive theological work? Now, the philosopher that I mentioned earlier, Rajesh Shampath, has spent some time pondering this possibility. Sampath asks, I quote, how the Christian faith might be reinterpreted through the eyes of a hypothetical robot. For example, such a robot might ask whether it too is in some way unique, or perhaps whether it too bears, either in the first or in the second instance, something of the image of God. Now, the point of this speculation is that in the not too distant future, robots might be able to produce their own original theological insights and concepts that in theory do not contradict the biblical witness or breach the boundaries of the Nicene Chalcedonian orthodoxy. Now, of course, realist, a realist and pragmatic retort, retort to this is that such technologies do not currently exist. However, as Mercy Amber Odoyoye invites us to do as theologians, our theology should not only operate on experience, but also on expectation. We can at least conclude that this is a fruitful field of reflection for humans. As Marius Dorobantu notes, I quote, it is in principle possible to imagine a radically different interpretation of the divine economy than the one that is dominated to date. He goes on to say, history shows that Christian theology, for example, gradually extends to include the perspectives of those who were formerly excluded. First Gentiles, later women, and then persons of color. And intelligent robots could be regarded as a legitimate hermeneutical claim on the spreading of those boundaries. Now, a core issue that this raises for historical and contemporary theologies is what the theologian James McBride identifies as the reality that, and I quote, virtually all Christian theologies are organic theologies. In his article, Robotic Bodies and the Kairos of Humanoid Theologies, he rightly points out that his, his historical and contemporary theologies have been exceedingly anthropocentric and almost exclusively organically linked to human bodies. However, we know that the body is not the only location for doing theology. Uh, persons like Ernst Conradi and other eco-theologians, people like Andrew Lindsay and animal theologians, help us to understand that there are a host of other sites outside of the human person that cause us to reflect on theological issues. Now, robot theology may constitute a further step in that direction. Not only does it suggest that theology can take place outside of the human body, but it also suggests that there are other forms of possible sentience and intelligence other than human sentience and intelligence that may be capable of valid and meaningful theological reflection. Now I can see you're really uncomfortable. Good, so am I. So let's talk a little bit about the Imago Day after Darwin. Let's delve into why some of us may feel uncomfortable. Now, as mentioned earlier, one of the initial gut level responses to ABOT, uh, AI robot theologies among theologians relates to the expectation of our human uniqueness. In large measure, this is based on our theological development of the concept that human persons uniquely bear the imago Dei, the image of God. Now, of course, this has been a rich seedbed for theological and ethical reflection on issues related such as human dignity, human equality before God and others. Um, and in large measure, these theologies are based on our reading of the Christian scriptures and uh, certain doctrinal concepts such as the incarnation of Jesus in human form. I think, for example, about Stanley Hauwas, who has this beautiful piece 
where he says, you know, if God had chosen to become incarnate as a penguin, we would have penguin dignity. But God chose uh, the form of a human person. Now, what we have done with this work is something that we need to be critical of. Humans have accorded to themselves exceptional status within the created order based on our interpretations of texts and creedal formulations, and I think uncritically, our need to retain power and privilege. However, we know, for example, the challenges like from people such as Lynn White uh, challenge our anthropological ex exceptionalism. Lynn White, for example, uh, famously claimed, some of you may know, that this theological perversion um, led to a moral crisis, which was the precursor of what we today understand as uh, ecological justice. But there is another important reason why we should call uh, anthropocentric exceptionalism into question. Again, Marius de Robontu helps us with this. He writes, as long as human superiority over animals was self-evident, this interpretation went largely unchallenged. However, with Darwinianism and the advent of evolutionary theory, it became very difficult for us to ground human distinctiveness on a purely ontological basis. We were suddenly not all that different from the animals that we used to compare ourselves to. Moreover, it became evident that as most of the intellectual abilities that rendered us distinctive have emerged naturally via evolution, as we heard from Hulani last night, they really just have to do with our stomachs and cooking food. They were not necessarily bestowed upon us as some divine gift supernaturally given by God. In the aftermath of this realization, theological anthropology has developed different interpretations of the image that are arguably more, more nuanced and sophisticated. Okay, I'm going to skip a little section of, of the paper there that you can read later. But basically, the point is that if we as theologians want to be honest with ourselves, Darwin changed our views of Christian anthropology. And we have to recognize that if we choose to center ourselves, we'll have to defend that. Uh, and it may be difficult to maintain. Now, let's turn to the notion of African relational ontology and human uniqueness in an age of AI, because this is the one thing. I'm not claiming that humans are not unique, but what I am testing is whether we are exceptional. Now, as you would have seen by now, I'm operating with two framing theological commitments. Firstly, that while humans are unique, we are not exceptional within the continuum of creation. This relies on a particular understanding of the doctrines of creation and the doctrine of anthropology. Second, that one of the things that makes us truly human is our identity, our personhood, which is formed within a nest of relationship with God, with other persons, and with the rest of non-human creation. And this relies on a particular understanding of the doctrine of God, particularly the Trinity and the doctrine of creation. Now, I've written quite a bit elsewhere on the notion of personhood and identity, who we are as persons, what we are as persons, and I'm not going to cover that here except to draw on three salient points that I believe African relational ontology has to offer to the current conversation. Firstly, we want to deal with the African conception of personhood, and here I'm thinking specifically about some Southern African conceptions. Now, the first important discussion point that we need to have in relation to doing theology in times of AI relates to notions of personhood. The terms person and human are often used synonymously in contemporary discussions on human identity. However, if we were to be honest, we would have to confer that this is not entirely accurate. There are indeed distinguishing approaches to the understanding of personhood and humanity. The first, distingu uh, the f first there is a distinction between ontological accounts of personhood and normative accounts of personhood. For example, I could ask the question, am I the same person that I was when I was 18 years old? 
has the person that I was when I was 18 years old ceased to exist? Now, of course, those of you who read philosophy will know that this kind of philosophical argument and ontological argument is similar to the, the argument for the ship of Theseus. If all of the components of the ship are replaced over the years through repair and maintenance, is it still the same ship? Now, this kind of ontological argument has two subcategories, and this is where African theology comes in. Firstly, there's a normative argument for personhood as it relates to the ontological claim. And they distinguish between the fact that not all persons have claims to belonging based on criteria of morality, rights, duty, and entitlements. Now, within this normative category, there are two further subcategories. First of all, there are minimal or threshold accounts of personhood. And secondly, there are maximist and perfectionist accounts. Are you wishing now that I'd done the PowerPoint? Good, me too. Okay, 10 minutes, I see it there. Thank you, colleagues. Now, minimal or threshold uh, accounts of personhood seek to provide some conditions for full or near rights to the claim of personhood. Now, when I was thinking about this, probably one of the most uh, yeah, uh, uh, vivid examples of this is the debate, uh, Manitza will know about this, in contemporary biomedical ethics that relates to abortion and the rights of the fetus. At what stage, minimally, uh, does that biological matter become a human person? Accorded the rights of personhood. So that's the minimal criteria. And some would say uh, the fact that, you know, there is not yet sentience or thought or experience doesn't disqualify uh, the person from the minimal claim to personhood. Then there are the maximist or uh, maximal or perfectionist accounts. Now, this is specifically where African relational ontology operates. In many uh, uh, philosophies, it it is argued that a person becomes more human or more of a person when one possesses certain moral or other characteristics. An example of this was when I was once asked by a member of my Setswana congregation, I was traveling to London, and she asked me, Muruti, Muruti, will you encounter people there? Are there people in London? She used the word Batu. Now, by this, by people, she meant, will there be people like us? People who recognize each other's humanity. People who might care for you if you are lost and you find that you need someone to give you directions. Now, this is very commonly related to the ethics of the concept of Ubuntu. Now, I'm not going to fall into the white male trap of farming on Ubuntu, but I think sometimes we give up on that concept uh, too easily. There are plenty of other uh, philosophers who deal with this. Minketi, for example, contends that personhood is Africa, in Africa is something which individuals could fail at. You could fail to be a person. And we know persons who, who fail at that. You could be incompetent or ineffective uh, at being a person. Now, of course, personhood is also at times detached from humanness in Western society. The most uh, common examples of that are what's happening currently in corporate law in the United States, where companies are being given uh, the values and protections that persons are, such as uh, the right to be protected from slander and other forms of abuse. Now, the issue around maximal personhood, I think, is very important for us as African theologians. The South African uh, philosopher Thaddeus Metz has developed, I think, the most comprehensive minimal conception of African personhood. Now, Metz's view arises out of this notion of Afro-communitarian emphases on harmonious relationships which form the end of morality. Perhaps the most quoted term that sums this up is the quote from Desmond Tutu, who says, harmony, Friendliness and community are great goods. Social harmony is for us as Africans the greatest good, the summum bonum. Anything that subverts or undermines this sought after good is to be 
avoided like the plague. Now, what Metz says is that building on African moral conceptions of personhood that argue that a true person requires the ability to live in deep and harmonious relationships of identity and solidarity as both a subjective and an objective component. As a subject, I need to be able to have the competencies of solidarity in relationship that can identify the we, that can recognize that I am, uh, my human humanity and my dignity is tied up with yours. Now that makes sense to most of us. However, in addition to that, Metz says there is also an objective element to communitarian humanism. We also need to be able to be recognized by others as having the capacities of being human. Now, one example of this is that humans have the capacity to care for all sorts of things, their possessions and their pets. However, we know that when we care for other humans, there is something in the return of that relationship that acknowledges our humanity. So let's come to a conclusion now. Can AI ever be a subject or an object of true relationship with humans? Now, the claims of strong AI are the claims that we will get to a stage where such technologies can exist and that there will be the possibility of robots becoming moral agents. Now, if this is the case, they may become genuine subjects of harmonious communal relationships, exhibiting solidarity and identity. However, the larger question, the bigger objection, is in relation to AI being an object of communal relationships with humans. We have got four minutes. Let's see if we can land this play. If hypothetically an AI technology were to pass the criterion of subjecthood, it would still raise the major barrier of being an object of communal relationships. So even if such a technology were to convince us that it was able to empathize with us, this would not count as sufficient for it to be part of the human moral community in the same way that persons are. Now, that makes sense as a general proposition. However, in a pragmatist, realist sense, we have to acknowledge that this is, in fact, already happening. How many of you remember Tom Hanks's 2000 movie, Cast Away? The ball with a face on it, eh? Now, Wilson, that's right. <laughs> now, we have seen that that kind of psychosocial relationship that people have is being expressed in many different ways. I want to commend to you, if you have a chance, to watch the movie Chappie. Have you seen it? About a robot that grows up in South Africa and because of its wounded upbringing, finds it difficult to be socialized. It's a heartbreaking story. Perhaps one of my favorite books of all time is the book that was released by Kauzo Ishigori in 2000 called Clara and the Sun. It literally helped me through the pandemic. It is a beautiful, beautiful book of human-robot relationships. But friends, we can see that even in the academy, there's a tremendous amount of research on the ways in which people are relating to technologies, whether it's through robo-psychology, robo whether it's through sex robots, or whether it's in cultures and communities where the populations are unable to care adequately through setting up robot companions to help people in their loneliness. Now, I would like to contend that before we have a knee-jerk reaction to artificial intelligences, we have to acknowledge as theologians that there is some possibility here and that we need to, we need to guard it. So let's land the plane. Here we are at the last point. Here are a couple of points that I extract from this discussion. What can we learn about ourselves, reality, and God from our engagement with AI? First, I have attempted to argue above that the reality of AI invites us to broaden our theological reflection 
beyond a mere anthropocentric focus. We might just need to consider that God has a relationship both with human and non-human creation. Second, our fascination with AI and the desire to create a technology in our own image that mimics our in image highlights, according to Hertzfeld, how we seek both to facilitate a relationship to the created order, but also to establish our uniqueness from the rest of creation. Uh, those of you who read the work of David Bentley Hart, uh, he wrote a beautiful piece on uh, Narcissus and the pool of Narcissus. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, the myth of Narcissus. He was a very handsome and attractive person. He saw his image in the pool and he was so attracted to himself that he couldn't draw away and eventually he dies uh, through starvation. And for some of us, that is what AI has become. It's become this sort of fascination that we can't get away from. However, the other side of the coin is that there is something of our image in these technologies, and that is both bad and good. We heard about this from Fulani, and there's lots of research about the problems with how these algorithms are, are biased and skewed. Okay, third. AI invites us to reflect on God's relationship to aspects of creation other than the human. For example, could there ever be technologies that bear the Imago Dei? Finally, since we have created these technologies in our own image, we need to acknowledge the ethical limitations and pitfalls, but also the human possibilities. Possibilities of care, empathy, of companionship and of fulfillment that such technologies may offer us. Indeed, colleagues, if theology is a story that is told, a song that is sung, and a prayer that is uttered in response to experience and expectation, our experience of being human in a world where AI exists and continues to in, uh, develop may invite us to a deep and constructive reflection on our expectations. Thank you.